Welcome to Creating a Family, talk about adoption and foster care. Today, we're going to be talking about helping children heal from sexual abuse. We'll be talking with Dr. Jennifer Shaw. She received her master's and doctorate in clinical psychology, and she specializes in the assessment and treatment of trauma in children, especially those who present with sexual behavioral problems. She is a psychologist at the Gill Institute for Trauma Recovery. Welcome, Dr. Shaw, to Creating a Family. Thank you, Don. Glad to be here. Um, this is a, a topic that you and I have talked uh, about in the past. It is a topic that you and I both feel you are a professional passion as, as well as me. Uh, I was, uh, I have come to realize in talking with many, many parents as well as caseworkers that if a child has uh, sexual abuse in their file, it has become like the scarlet letter A. People are afraid, parents are afraid to have them in their home. Caseworkers say they have an increasingly hard time finding families for them. And so I, uh, I, I'm so thankful that you are here to help us understand more about the complexities uh, of sexual abuse and as it compares to other forms of abuse, trauma, and neglect. So let's start with uh, the very basic, which would be, what do, what do we consider sexual abuse? Is, does it have to be penetration? Does it have to be, can it be touching? Does it, ha what does it, what, how, how big of a, of a, of a, a definition do we, how big of a net do we cast? Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, a general definition is child, child sexual abuse is really any contact or behavior, you know, without the consent of a person and a child can never get, give consent. So it might be sexual assault or sexual violence, but also exploitation of a child or looking at the child or any behavior um, that suggests the, the abuser is um, seeking gratification mm -hmm. by either touching the child or viewing the child's body. Then that child has been sexually victimized. What about a child who is exposed to adult sexual activity? Adult sexual activity, either uh, direct witnessing or pornography, yes. Okay, all right. Now, adoptive, foster, and kinship parents often don't know prior to fostering or adopting that the child has experienced sexual abuse. So what type of behaviors might indicate that a child has had experienced sexual abuse of any form? It's a good question. You know, in our field, we'll often get reports from children in foster care or have recently been adopted where there might be language like suspected, right? But the, but the information remains relatively unknown. Um, and that, that leaves people, you know, nervous and what to look for. So it's a good question. It's also a hard question because each child is different and each abuse experience is different. But in general, I would put it in two categories. You're looking for externalizing behaviors, which might be a sexual acting out or a curiosity beyond what's age typical. Um, or it might be um, curiosity to the point of touching another child or seeking to touch another child. And then there's internalizing behaviors, and that might be more worried about um, showing their body or more distrust of, of adult strangers than might be typical. But it's difficult to tease out. You know, with a, a child who's been victimized, um, they'll often feel a deep sense of shame, um, or they might act out and become dysregulated. Um, and only after a period of time where there's safety and security might you be able to find out what's going on underneath, which may include a victimization experience. Mm -hmm. So what children are at greatest risk for being sexually abused? Well, children where they're in an environment that might have been chaotic. So a supervision is a, is, is lack of supervision is often um, consistent with children who either were abused by older children in the home or other adults in the home. Um, so there's dysfunctional family patterns, lack of supervision. Um, but also when there's physical abuse and multiple adults in the home, multiple transitions between homes. Um, so generally there's instability of an adult caregiver as well as a supervision issue. Mm -hmm. So in other words, a lot of children who do end up in uh, institutionalized settings, foster care, whatever, are at higher risk. And with a history of domestic violence in the home, yes. Mm -hmm. So how does the impact of abuse differ depending on the relationship of the abuser to the child? And I, what I'm thinking of is like, well, a stranger abuse versus mm -hmm. uh, your uncle or your father or your brother, mm -hmm. something along those lines. 
Another good question and a significant one in terms of what to do next uh, in terms of treatment. Um, so I, I would say, you know, stranger abuse is relatively uncommon compared to the known um, perpetrators. And um, we're, we're, we're now talking about this much more in our society, which is helpful to children to know that it's not, you know, when you tell, it's not always because a stranger has been inappropriate. Sometimes it's because it's somebody mom and dad trusted. Um, and that's what we, what we generally refer to as a, as a more complex trauma. And it can have longer lasting effects. That, that essentially means there's a betrayal of trust. There's somebody that the child or the family trust, but also things are happening that make the child uncomfortable. And so there's these really complicated feelings that emerge. So that's an interpersonal trauma, an interpersonal type of, of sexual abuse, which is much more common and also has much deeper ramifications psychologically. And if it's the child's primary caretaker, that adds further complications. Absolutely. And yes, it adds further complications. In terms of recovery, um, what we really look for is what happened next, Dawn. Once it happened, once the abuse occurred with a trusted caregiver, was there another trusted caregiver that came along, believed the child, and protected the child? That's really what will dictate how the child starts to resolve what occurred. Oh, good. Well, we're going to come to that towards the end. Mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. Um, to know that there's there's hope that we can do things that we specifically can do. Let's do a, a brief refresher on on the typical um, psychosexual development in children and how sexual abuse impacts that. Because I do talk to people and they and and they are ups worried about sexual abuse with a foster child or an adopted child, but once they learn that this behavior is actually fairly typical of children, sexual exploration, sec sexual curiosity, it helps, it helps relax them. And then there's some behaviors that are, are, are not typical. So I think it's helpful for parents to know the distinction because either they don't remember or, uh, of their own youth or the other children that they've raised, they were unaware of their sexual development. So are they, are they just, they were, they, you know, their children weren't particularly that curious. Mm -hmm. Another good question, and we, you know, through the lifespan, what we will often tell parents as, as we try to differentiate typical sexual behavior to atypical is, first, the starting point is all children are sexually curious, mm -hmm. and sexual development starts as soon as they enter the world. So when we, when, as they're growing, even through toddlerhood, they have different interests in their own body and other bodies. Um, and then they become in preschool, and we all see this, right? They want to play doctor or house, and the interest increase. So especially around four to six, we'll often see a spike. There's an increased curiosity. Um, and also, because of that, there's, there starts to be an opportunity for creating awareness of the child. What is kind of left for more private, um, it, for the private parts to be, um, you know, cared for and cleaned only by adults you trust. And there's opportunity within that preschool to early childhood years that some children get and some children don't. But the reality is all children will express curiosity and all children will test the boundaries of that. What we look for in terms of when it crosses over to atypical and potentially problematic is if a parent responds in a non-punitive way and gives some brief education to the child about appropriate boundaries, and the child then continues to push the boundary and maybe even becomes secretive about it. Um, you know, most children, once they're taught the boundary, they'll move on to other types of play, mm -hmm. right? But children who maybe have something, there's an impulsive um, uh, quality to the behavior or there's an abuse experience, the curiosity is too intense for the more standard boundary. And so they may seek to do it in secret. And that's when parents will come in and say, I think this is beyond you know, the, what's developmentally typical. And I might say, yes, and that might not mean the child needs treatment. It might need a little bit of parent coaching. Hmm. Okay. Yes, because it, be, it could be abnormal, but it also could be that it's a child that is I mean, some children have different levels of curiosity and different temperaments, uh, different, right. uh, yeah, so all of that. And there might have been a secondary gain from it, you know, so we don't know yet if the child is, um, if, if the child gets a lot of attention from that, they may be doing it again to get the same attention. And so we don't necessarily want to do an intervention of child therapy or sexual abuse 
you know, uh, work with a child um, if it's actually more a dynamic or a relationship issue between the child and the parent. You want to start with the parent. Excellent. Can children heal from sexual abuse? Absolutely, and all the time. So I think there is a general uh, preconceived idea that children who have been sexually abused will become abusers, either in their, in their childhood or in, in adulthood. What's the truth behind that? Well, it is a, it is a fear. Um, and a lot of parents, therefore, um, their interventions tend to be fear-driven. But there's very little empirical evidence for that. There is, there does seem to be more of a likelihood of further victimization um, and, and, and the adult becoming a perpetrator for males who were abused by females. But what I think is more important is what, what the studies will show is there's little empirical evidence, one, and two, the the probability of it becoming a behavior that the child adopts really depends on what the world and the adults do after the abuse. So the rates are higher, for example, if a child's been sexually abused, but the protective factors were absent. There was not a supportive caregiver that immediately protected and believed. The world did not show the child that it in fact most of the time was a safe place, even though something bad happened. So if they're continually in a chronically dysfunctional home and they haven't met supportive caregivers so they can begin to heal, then yes, they will be at higher risk. But really the question is how, what can adults do to prevent that from happening? Not whether or not the, the children are ready to heal. It depends on how the world responds to them once we find out they've been hurt. Yes, I, thank you. That is, that's, that sounds so spot on to me and, and from what I see as well. Let me pause for a moment to remind people that this show and all the resources at Creating a Family is underwritten by the support of the Jockey Bean Family Foundation. They want all adoption agencies to know that they are eligible to participate in a wonderful program called the Jockey Bean Family Backpack Program. Newly adopted children will have access to a backpack and it is a personalized backpack that um, is got the child's initials on it inside. There is a blanket and a bear, and most important, a parent tote with information for parents for post-adoption support. Uh, so if you're a parent listening, please have your agency reach out to Jockey Being Family at their website, jockeybeingfamily.com. Click on backpack and your agency can subscribe and um, you, your child and other children who follow uh, will be able to uh, have one of these backpacks. So thank you. All right, we are talking about helping children heal from sexual abuse. So let's jump right in. Uh, you have said that one of the most crucial elements as to how children will, how, how impactful abuse will be for a child, both in the short term and the long term, is what happens both immediately afterwards, but also further down the road. Uh, the adults in a child's life, uh, how they respond and how they can help a child. So how can parents help a child heal after sexual abuse? And in the case where uh, most of the cases that uh, we're talking about, the child has been abused in the past and likely has either been removed from the home or in the case of international adoptions, a child would have been brought from uh, an orphanage, removed from the situation, uh, removed from the orphanage, and so is now in a home with parents who are uh, ready and willing to help that child heal. So they don't have the advantage of immediately being able to respond to a child, but they do have the advantage of, uh, of now being in the child's life. So what can what are the factors? You've talked about protective factors. Let's talk about some of the protective factors and then move into what parents can do to help. Um, first of all, the first thing a, a, a parent can do is to become an infor informed caregiver. And this is a complicated topic, and it's scary. It's scary for a lot of parents and adults. Um, but with more information, a caregiver can become pretty confident that healing will occur and competent in providing a space for that recovery to occur in their home. So with information, it becomes a research-informed approach versus fear-driven. 
And that's number one for the caregivers to relax. And when the if behaviors emerge, they know what to do. And they're armed with information, not myth. That's the most, most important thing. From then, the protective factors, when we, when we use that phrase, we're really referring to, is the child believed and, fe- and, and felt heard and understood? Was the response from a caregiver or the world around them, I'm so sorry this happened, in whatever words that is. I'm so sorry this happened, and we're going to work together to move through this and make sure this doesn't happen again. And believe the child. And, and in most cases, they will need some specialized treatment, not necessarily long-term. It depends on what the other pre-existing factors were. But the protective factors in terms of long-term recovery really depends on at least one caregiver who serves as an anchor and an informed ally throughout the healing. Because for example, if a child's five and healing, their, their needs are gonna be different in terms of recovery. Things might emerge again at age nine and again at puberty. And so they really do need to be an ally throughout development. What do you mean by a parent being an anchor? That the home and the primary caregiver, whatever happens outside the the home, whether that's school or the community or the past, that the home is a place that is predictable and the child is respected, their body is respected. And the home and the caregiver becomes an anchor for whatever else might happen. Kind of like an anchor in the middle of a storm. You know, you, can, you stay steady. You, you are seen, you are understood, and no matter what happens, you can go home. And you will be okay, and you will be understood, and you will be protected. When you said that uh, parents, uh, one of the things for parents is to feel uh, confident that healing will occur. But how do you address a parent who is not feeling confident, who is afraid? Uh, Because I think you're spot on that I think a lot of times our responses are fear-based because we're frightened. We, we, this this behavior seems, it it just seems uncomfortable when we see children um, acting out sexually or talking sexually. It just feels uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Well, first, you know, we, we encourage them to talk to other parents who have been through it, but also possibly a therapist who can serve as a parent coach in this regard, because there are a lot of myths, even phrases like you mentioned Scarlet Letter, but it, there might be permanent damage maybe floating around in their minds. Or, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, or, or these lifetime scars. And there is no doubt that it's life altering especially the chronic and more complex, as I talked about, where there's a betrayal of a trusted caregiver. Absolutely, that that can be life altering. Um, On the other hand, it's not true that there is permanent damage. And so working with someone to say, hey, this is how the brain repairs. And a a child's brain especially, it's, 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 it's very plastic. So how they experience the world from here forward is what's most important mm-hmm. to healing. Mm-hmm. And I've worked with countless children who the parents have a harder time recovering than the children, and it's the fear. Mm-hmm. Children are not fearful about their future. They're curious and they're spontaneous. Adult ideas that there's going to be lifelong problems can create anxiety that then gets in the way of a parent-child relationship. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, they may need treatment and increased supervision initially as they reset their understanding of how things work given their prior world. Um, But the the main thing is for parents to arm themselves with education. And we now know, yes, children get better depending on what we adults do next. Not depending on what they do. It's what the world shows them and how the world responds to them. And that's our job as adults. So getting educated, uh, certainly uh, listening to this uh, is, a, is a first step in that direction, and, and that's great. So congratulations to all of you who are listening. Um, but where are other, what are other resources for parents to become the educated ally? Um, I think we can work on being, I think we already provide a lot of information on how to be the anchor, but how to become the educated ally for the child, the educated part is what I'm focusing on. So where can people get information other than creating a family? 
Mm -hmm. Well, one, you, you can look online. I would, I would, I would point um, really anyone the direction of the work by Dr. Eliana Gill. She, she does talk um, extensively about, a, you know, present and future oriented healing of children. Um, and her work does um, help to debunk some of the myths that keep us fearful. Um, and, and maybe looking for behaviors that we're, we're missing the opportunity to, to heal. Um, and arm yourself with education on basic child development, including psychosexual development. Mm -hmm. Some things may emerge that are not that are not problematic. They're just opportunities to learn, mm -hmm. um, learn new boundaries, and and move forward. So some of some of the the sexual development, and also there are there are professionals in most communities that work in the field of sexual abuse um, and, and childhood trauma um, more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, to just go in and ask questions, even if it's I'm considering having a child with a suspected history, you know, what, what would I look for and what, what might this child need when they come and, and start to get educated that way. Just asking the questions and it probably will start to debunk the myths that keep parents worried um, about bringing a child home with a suspected history. Mm -hmm. Because how can that fear... Uh understandable fear and i don't think either and i or you either you or, or i are, is trying to downplay it but how can that fear uh, interfere with the child even healing right well and that's a that's really critical if um you know i'll often say in my, in my own work um to parents even if they come into my office and they're incredibly anxious you know the the children are then experiencing their their parent as afraid of them or afraid of their behavior. Mm -hmm. And for a child who's been abused, they're looking for the world to tell them what to do next. And if caregivers are behaving in a way that's uncertain or sends a message of anxiety, the child's gonna further keep thoughts and feelings to themselves and feel bad or different. And then in that way, other symptoms can start to emerge, right? Because they, they may, their cue is you're kind of on your own with this because this is too much for adults. That's how they read it. You know, my mom or my dad or my foster mom doesn't really know what to do. That's, that's the message when there's a really anxious parent. Um, and, and then they feel like they're on, they're on their own and that can deepen the shame mm -hmm. and increase other, other behaviors, inappropriate behaviors, because they're left feeling like, they must be so different from other children that adults cannot help them. That can be the unintended message. Or adults are afraid of them. Yes, yes. And what they need, and they can get this in treatment, but we always work with families and parents, is everybody around them really to send a message of, we got this. This happens sometimes. We're sorry it happens, but there are certain things we can do to make you feel less afraid and more trusting, and we're in this together, we got this. If you send that message of confidence to a child, they then become confident they can heal, and you start to see that in their recovery. If we're not confident, they're not going to be confident. Mm -hmm. And so if a child, oftentimes children come to us, and as you say, we either don't know, they may say suspected, but very often we don't even see suspected. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that's because I think that uh, caseworkers and social workers are sometimes afraid to put that if they're not 100% sure because they know it's going to make it really hard for that child right. to find a home. So, uh, so we don't know. But as the child starts uh, settling into our homes and our home and mm -hmm. is feeling more comfortable and begins to trust us, a child may disclose uh, either outright or, or drop hints that uh, they have experienced abuse, uh, sexual abuse in the past. How should a parent respond if their child opens up to them? It's a really good question. Again, it's a, I, I would say it's, it's, it's typically an individualized response, but in general, um, just a statement that they're, you know, thank you for letting me know that's a really, really hard thing to hold by yourself. And I'm so glad you told me. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about this together. I say a general response because you really don't want to over question a child too much in some situations because they may need to do a forensic interview. For example, somebody may need to talk to the child to get information. Um, but the, the important thing is, is that there's an immediate 
um, uh, response to the child of, I'm so glad you told me, we're going to figure this out together. Mm -hmm. The, and, and then find out and, and make decisions then who should, yeah, whether you have to do a forensic interview mm -hmm. or right into therapy. Mm -hmm. So what do families uh, look like who are able to help children heal from sexual abuse? You've mentioned a couple of things. Uh, parents uh, who are willing to be educated. <laughs> That's certainly. Uh, parents who are willing to create stability uh, in the child's life in general, um, as well as uh, parents who are, uh, this is probably not the uh, professional, but are, are not going to freak out um, and are willing to try to remain calm. Um, so what are some other uh, descriptors that you could say for families uh, who are able to help children heal from this? I, uh, those are those are perfect. I would I would add willing and able to anticipate behaviors that may emerge. Um, sexual abuse, especially um, when a child becomes what what many of us call abuse reactive, which means they're acting out sexually for a period of time after after the abuse, and may need some some help with some sexual behavior problems that you, if you're anticipating what might come, you can then prepare for a response. So if receiving a child and you're not, and the symptoms emerge, you may, in your words, freak out. Um, but there usually are some pretty short interventions. And when you're ready for them, you're essentially putting the child back on a developmental path. They're testing limits and they're doing what maybe they used to do or what the world used to teach them. And we're just redirecting them with appropriate boundaries, talking about privacy versus secrecy, willingness to have those difficult conversations, and when a behavior emerge, change our mindset to there's a real opportunity to, um, to change this child's perspective versus this is therefore the beginning of the end, that kind of fear-based thinking, that it's a symptom that happens, but it's not a sign of permanent damage. Mm -hmm that the child, it's a symptom and the child can heal and your job is to, at that point, figure out the best way to help that child heal. And because it's sexual abuse, it's much more complicated and brings up a lot of fears in us as adults, mm -hmm. but sometimes it can be helpful to step back. If we get a child who has been in an aggressive or violent home and when they're in our home, they're aggressive, they're, they're punching, they're slapping, you know, we don't necessarily hesitate and ask ourselves, what should we do next? We step in, we set a boundary, we set rules for the home, we show you know, positive discipline and love, um, but we lean in a little bit more easily than when it's a symptom of sexual abuse. We as adults carry so much um, around sexual abuse that we lean out, when in fact the child needs exactly what we would do with a non-sexual behavior. That's what they need from us. Mm -hmm. Boy, that said, that's perfectly said. We do lean away because it goes back to the fear and the discomfort right. we have when we think of, of, of sexuality in children. That's right. And it sends them a message that they must be so different than every other child because parents are nervous around them and then they're left isolated and often feeling very ashamed. Okay, so let's talk some practical tools. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we hear very often is uh, when it's a couple where the father said, I, 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 don't, uh, the, I don't want to have a child, a girl or a boy, I guess, who has been sexually abused because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm afraid that I will be accused. I'm afraid that I will never be able to be left alone with the child. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't want that and I don't want to have to worry about that. So what are some practical things that we can offer for uh, parents who are worried about that, the specifically having a father uh, not be fear of false accuse, uh, accusations or not being able to be left alone with the child. And it's it's an understandable fear, um, of course. Um, but but if we if you are working, if the family is working um, with a professional and there's a team around the family, if and when that allegation takes place, it can be seen as a symptom of the child and the family come together. So really creating a community around the, around the adoption or the fostering um, can mitigate the risk of that having any long lasting impacts on the family. Could it happen? Yes. 
Um, but it's also, you know, we have children who will then make allegations of different people at school and allegations can start to um, kind of emerge during that phase of, of treatment. But, the, um, but as long as, again, we lean in and you have a community, um, you know, that, that usually will, will pass. That doesn't happen as much as people fear, though. Um, I don't have, you know, it's not, it's not as if my caseload is full of parents who have had an allegation after. Uh, it's, it's relatively rare. Um, but, but if it happens, there's usually already an understanding of what the child's doing and what they're, um, what they're expressing they need. All right. Another thing we hear from families is the fear of bringing in a child who has been sexually abused because they have other children in the household and they generally will share two, two fears. One, uh, the fear that the children are already in the household. Uh, will become victims if the child will act mm -hmm. out sexually on them, or that the, ch the children in the home will be, even if not acted out sexually, will be exposed to more sexual behaviors, sexual information, things that, uh, as someone said, uh, you know, do I bring this child in and then rob my other children of their childhood? So mm. let's talk from a practical standpoint um, about that fear and what parents can do. Well, that's a very real, real fear, especially when, when there's children younger than the, maybe the, the child that's brought into the home. However, I would, I would say that, that most children who have been sexually abused are not a risk to other children. So just because there's a history of sexual abuse does not mean that they are um, uh, at risk of sexually abusing another child. However, sometimes there are sexual acting out behaviors which does mean there'll be a period of time of the parent needing to have within eyesight, within the earshot supervision um, and stepping in and setting new rules and parameters. And sometimes that does mean having conversations with the other children about what to do. And so my advice would be to be the parents who are willing to do, to bring the child into the home that is sexually acting out is to go ahead and talk to the other children and be very specific about, you know, should something happen that makes you uncomfortable or there's a boundary, you know, as, as this new child is learning new boundaries, this is what you do. You know, sometimes we'll say, make sure you tell an adult to a child. Well, most children need something more specific. How do I tell? When do I tell? Um, and just set some basic, basic rules about communicating when feeling uncomfortable and everybody kind of had of a plan and, and talk about it openly. It doesn't have to be a lot of detailed information, it's just everybody's anticipating, if this happens, this is what we're going to do. But until you feel a little bit more confident about the child, the within eyesight supervision during that phase would be the, the first approach. So when you say be specific, before the child or, or shortly after the placement, talking with the children are already in your home about helping them understand boundaries, our private mm -hmm. parts are our private parts. Nobody should ask mm -hmm. to see or touch your private part. You mean that's mm -hmm. that type of conversation. And that if somebody, and if somebody wants, it tries to touch your private parts or wants to see your private parts, you come tell mommy or you come tell daddy mm -hmm, and you tell mm -hmm. them, you say, tell them no. And then you come to us and you will not be in trouble. Do you mean that type of, of conversation? I do. And it's obviously going to be different depending on the age of the child, but sometimes it helps kids to be very specific in terms of, um, I say the difference between privacy and secrecy to just just say, kids, you know, private part secrets are never for keeping. It's too much for any child to hold. And then maybe even anticipate, you know, and give sp specific examples. You know, what if um, somebody does do something that makes you uncomfortable, but they say, please keep it a secret. What might you do next? Well, I'd tell because private part secrets are never secrets to keep. Um, or they say that they're going to be your best friend if you don't tell. And really help them kind of think through these things through through specific examples. Okay, so you're as as much as and children. I'm sorry, and children have a hard time using it. I have some families that that when they're uncomfortable, they might have a place in the home where the child will put a note. Right, come talk to me. I have something to tell you, or they'll choose a symbol of I need some time to to talk with you. Because if you can imagine a child coming up and saying, "Hey, this happened." Sometimes they're not quite sure how to do that. And so they can talk together about, um, I, have, I have one child who will put 
um, a red sock in his father's drawer to say he kind of want to talk talks about something that came up, but he doesn't know how is essentially so the father will, you know, take some time and ask some questions. Sometimes children need us. So some some way for the children to give a clue. Um, hey, can you find some time? I don't know how to bring this up. And just having those conversations and planning for if that happens and you want to tell me something, but you don't know how, what can we do? Okay, perfect. And um, some of the recommendations we hear um, oftentimes from agencies uh, is mm. to put in uh, locks on doors, to put in cameras, uh, and particularly because at nighttime is the concern. So to have cameras around and have children know, what are your, know that the cameras exist. What are your thoughts on either locks or, or cameras? Um, locks, I would, I would um, be, be really cautious about, especially a child with a, with a trauma history, because you have this concurrent goal of having the home be a place that when the doors are closed at night, this is your family and this is a safe and secure environment. Safety is always a, an issue with a child who's, child who's sexually acting out. Um, but there are, um, there are non-invasive ways to do that. There are chimes on the door just until the parent is sure of the sleeping patterns. You know, the child goes to bed at eight. Do they really sleep through the night? There's a phase of uncertainty about what the child's patterns are, making sure children have their own space and bedrooms. Um, so sometimes chimes will just wake a parent up whenever a child leaves the room to go to the bathroom and, and, and cameras can be helpful too. Again, it depends on, on how high risk the child is. Locks I would be careful about because again, a lot of these children are coming from um, a really, really uh, difficult past environment. And it sends a, it sends a message um, that you can't be trusted. And what if they're leaving their room to go to the bathroom, for example, mm -hmm. or get a cup of water. So um, anyway, case by case, but, but there are, there are some chimes available that I've seen work really well. It's just a gentle awakening of the parent and the parent will come in and guide them back to bed or get them what they need. Um, and, and, and people can have a sense of safety. Mm -hmm. Because we do want to provide safety, not only yes. for the new child coming into the family, but also for the children existing already in the family. That's right. That's that's that is the that is most important. Some children who have things like locks, though, what can end up happening is a power struggle where kids will then try to find out how to get around the locks. So that that can start a different series of behaviors. So if it, if, if if something that restrictive is needed, it's needed. But in the beginning, seeing how um, how the child can do with um, with other measures is probably the best approach. And again, most sexual abuse young children are not acting out sexually. But if it becomes a concern, then you can look yeah. at measures like a chime and different rules for bedtime. So summarizing some of what you have said as far as what to do with uh, protective factors, things that we can do as parents. One would be mm -hmm. before the child comes or as soon as we become aware that there may be a, a problem, talk with the children existing in the home uh, and not only explicitly talk about private versus secret, private parts or private parts that for you only in that, but, but also to give them, anticipate that they may have a hard time uh, talking about this and giving them some uh, nonverbal ways to indicate to you that, that there may be a problem. So that's certainly one of them. The other one, um, having the child within your sight until you learn the child's behaviors and you learn the child's triggers and you learn whether the child has any interest in, in acting out sexually or any other way. Uh, another thing you've said is lean in. And I really like that as opposed to, uh, I have this image, you know, when children are, are, are physically spatting or whatever, or, uh, we do, we lean in, we come in and we, and we physically uh, are involved in their space to help them learn how to self-regulate. But if it's a sexual activity, you're so right. We just, we lean away. I mean, both figuratively and literally. And so mm -hmm. to focus on uh, redirection, that that's the real key here is that we're, we're thinking in terms of redirecting, just like we would redirect a child who is, is hitting or screaming or saying mm -hmm. a bad word or any of the other things that children might do who have come from chaotic environments. Um, 
and then physical things like chimes and 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 for nighttime trying to and practical things such as making sure children have alone space in their rooms and things like that that's right yeah and and bathroom rules you know you want to get very very specific maybe the family makes a poster of certain privacy rules in the home when a new child comes in um, where everybody has the bathroom time alone what are the rules for when you wear a shirt and really setting um, you know frankly, pretty specific boundary rules around the body if the child has been exploited. So that this is a place where they are protected, safe, and the boundaries are really, really clear. And we could be a little more uh, specific on that. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're saying the boundaries, okay, the bathroom, when, when you go in the bathroom and you mm -hmm. shut the door, uh, nobody can mm -hmm. come in. They can knock on the door, but they can't come in because that's your private space. Um, mm -hmm. And so do you mean for the adults to have rules as far as uh, when mom gets up, she puts on a robe in the morning, or, or do you mean for the children to say that, uh, you know, you don't run around without your clothes and, and you always make sure you have <laughs> that type of thing? That's yes, yes. I was thinking more for the children when there's multiple children in the home, but also if it's a child where there is known sexual abuse, again, creating a home um, that really is sending a message to the child that that there is privacy, it will be respected, bodies are respected. So while there's, you know, families operate in different ways and we would never tell a family what their own boundary rules are or different things with clothing. On the other hand, if it's a child who's been abused, you might need to tweak it for a little while because again, it's an opportunity to reset the child's perspective of, of, of uh, body privacy and private parts. And so when you might not necessarily wear a robe all the time in that beginning phase, you're really, it's really about sending a message to the child that this is the way we do things here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Close the bathroom door. When parents are in the bathroom, you need to knock too. So it might be different than what the family used to do before, mm -hmm. but in this phase, it's really, we're, we are this child's world now and the message we're sending is, is, is an opportunity for the child to reconsider how adults live, how they should live, and it's really through modeling that that happens. So when you're setting up these rules, do you involve the children in the making of the rules? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes do it in session or, or and, and families can take the poster home or work on it themselves, but even if it's in the child's own language and having them talk about it, um, whether it's not when you leave the bathroom, should you have a robe on and a shirt or how can we do this? And everybody kind of create a poster on these are our privacy rules in the house. Okay. So you make rules, mm -hmm. everybody uh, contributes to their mm -hmm. rules and, uh, and then, and it's written down and it's posted and we remind people when, uh, when, when people forget, which they sometimes will. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about, uh, you said a couple of things about therapy. Um, and while you say that people can find a therapist, I think that um, I think that's sometimes harder said than done. So yes, it is. What should, uh, especially with, with issues, uh, I think for, for general trauma, it's, it feels easier. But I think mm -hmm. with this specific trauma, I think therapists lean out mm -hmm. as well. I don't think it's just parents. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, what, uh, how, what should parents look for when trying to find a therapist to work with their family? Mm -hmm. A couple of things. First, um, a therapist who has trained and experience in working with young and school-age children. So the basics in um, child development. So a background in child development and child therapy. Um, and a specialization in childhood trauma. Um, there's, there's also a certification um, that's called registered play therapy, when, which can be helpful um, because that it's called an RPT. So you can look for someone with an RPT. Um, however, that, that by itself isn't sufficient. But somebody who has training and experience in trauma and sexual abuse. And I would also say um, to ask the questions of, does that person collaborate? And are they pretty family focused? Because, yeah. for example, if you have a therapist who has a child for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, but there's not parent coaching or collaboration with school and home, it's going to be, the, the effectiveness is really limited, even with the best therapist. Mm -hmm. So I, I picked up on that. You said that a couple of times that when you work, mm -hmm. you work with the family and, and that makes such good sense because even if you're seeking therapy more than once a week, that's still a relatively limited time. Mm -hmm. And the parents are the ones who need to be 
uh, trained on how. And so, so one of the things to look for is a therapist that will work with the parent and their, their goal is to help that parent become the educated ally. Mm -hmm. That's right. And there's different ways that providers will structure that. Sometimes they bring in another parent therapist or have a session with the parents. But that's just a question I would say to ask in the beginning is, you know, do you collaborate? Can we also meet? Um, and and um, what their experience is with sexual abuse. Because just like you, we want parents to be confident and competent, if a therapist is not quite sure, then, then that's gonna be a really difficult time for the child because the child will probably pick up on it. And so the relationship of the child and the therapist and, um, and, and be willing to try you know, one or two. It can take time to find somebody that's a good fit for the, for the family. Um, but you, 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 you really want to prioritize a, th a therapist who is going to do the leaning in, mm -hmm. you know, naming it, being willing to talk about it and being willing to collaborate. And if that's, that's not a, a signal that you're getting when talking to a therapist, then it's probably best to look, to look elsewhere. And so the, depending on the age of the child, play therapy could be the format that is used, but it's not mm -hmm. exclusive. It's not the only format. It's, it's not. I mean, our, uh, in RPT, a registered play therapist is helpful. But again, the solid therapist also, they, they have an extensive training in sexual abuse, but also um, child development and child therapy approaches. Play therapy is one of them. Okay. And is there a uh, certification, specific training, anything that you could look for uh, to know that, that therapists would have specific training to handle this issue? Or is that wishful thinking on my part? No, it's not wishful thinking, and there are different um, there are different training programs out there. It tends to be a certification, though. So when you're looking at a therapist website, for example, you can look for a certification in trauma, or that that is their specialty within their practice. Um, but I, again, that's it's it's it comes down to the parent intake on the phone. What is your experience? How young? children do you work with? How do you work with young children? You know, if they typically see adolescents, then you wouldn't want to bring your four-year-old because that's not something that they would be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the, the fundamental message that I, I'm, I hear from you and I find it so refreshing is that children can and do heal from sexual abuse. And we as parents, uh, can feel confident that we can learn how to be an, mm -hmm. an ally, how to be an aid in this healing. That's right. That's right. Children can and do heal, um, but it depends on what we do as adults. Which is empowering because that mm -hmm. gives us power to help as opposed to feeling helpless, which I think that's part of the fear base and the leaning away base is, is because mm -hmm. we feel powerless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and it's it's uh, oftentimes very innocent, right? People don't want to do the wrong thing. Uh -huh. And so they're leaning out because they're just not sure. Um, but if, if we lean in together and compassionately and with firm boundaries um, in an educated way, children, children do get better. And it's, um, it's as difficult as this work is. It's why I love it. Because if you surround the child with allies and just one anchor, it's amazing how quick recovery can happen, but it's not going to happen if we don't have a confident um, uh, caregiver at home. Mm -hmm. A confident caregiver. So mm -hmm. that's where we want our, we want mm -hmm. people to feel that uh, the confidence that they can empower change and he healing in this job. Yeah. Yeah. Expect difficulties and anticipate a response. <laughs> is that my grandmother's uh, 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 hope for the best, expect the worst, hope for the best, and settle for anything in between? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Similar, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me pause for a moment and remind people that this uh, show is brought to you by the support of our partner agencies, uh, which are agencies that believe in our mission, the pre preparing parents before adoption and fostering and then supporting them throughout the, the, the journey and throughout the lifetime of, of their family. One such partner is Spence Chapin. They are a licensed and accredited nonprofit organization in the New York City metro area that has been offering adoption services for more than 100 years. They are known for their robust post-adoption services and they provide them to birth parents, adoptive parents, and adoptees. 
uh, and it's and they continue to support all three uh, members of the triad throughout uh, throughout the throughout their lives. It's a great organization. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jennifer Shaw, for being with us today to talk about uh, a topic that is is an uncomfortable topic for others, but but I so appreciate your passion and your um, your optimism, uh, and I, I think it's well placed. And I, I I truly appreciate the work that you do, as well as the work that's being done at the Gill Institute. Uh, let me remind everybody that the shows express the shows. Listen to me. The views expressed in the show are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the position of Creating a Family, our partners, or our underwriters. Also, keep in mind that the information given in this interview is general advice. To understand how it applies to your specific situation, you need to work with your adoption or foster care professional. Thank you for joining us today, and I will see everyone next week.